From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. We start today in Washington, where finance officials from Ukraine are attending those IMF World Bank meetings, asking for more economic support for the country, even as President Z uh, Zelensky over in Kyiv is inviting President Biden to come visit. We turn now to our Washington correspondent. He's Joe Matthew, host every day of the week on Sound On on Bloomberg Radio. So, Joe, what's the response to the invitation from President Zelensky? Likely the same that we've been getting as we've been asking for weeks if President Biden might go to Ukraine, might even go to Kiev, David. The answer so far has been we have no plans to make a trip like that. Not saying no, but nothing is in the works right now. The Secret Service would likely not take too kindly to the idea of putting the commander in chief in the middle of a war zone like that. But it could be that other U.S. officials uh, do this very same thing, David. We'll just have to wait to see as this war enters a new and deadlier phase. As we've been discussing for weeks, this moment appears to have arrived. The Russian military raining missiles down across Ukraine today and, in fact, claiming that hundreds of targets were hit. One of them, Lviv, that western city about 40 miles away from the Polish border has become a base for Western journalists, for refugees, even government officials saw its first casualties of the war today, according to Ukrainian officials. All the while, the world is watching Mariupol could fall within days, according to military analysts talking with Bloomberg News. And President Zelensky has made it very clear that if the remaining Ukrainian forces in Mariupol are taken out by the Russians, that would likely eliminate any potential for a negotiated settlement to this war, David. Yeah, we heard from the prime minister yesterday of, of Ukraine saying that they are not going to surrender out there in Mariupol. It's, it's really laying waste to the entire city. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Joe Matthew. You can listen to Joe on Sound On every day of the week at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. For an expert perspective now on what's going on in the war, we turn to Leon Panetta of the Panetta Institute for Public Policy. He, of course, served as Secretary of Defense and Director of the CIA under to President Obama and as Chief of Staff for President Clinton. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being back with us. Let's start with Mariupol. Uh, we don't know what will happen there. We have to consider the possibility it may fall, given what's been done there. What would be the strategic significance of Mariupol falling? I, th I think it, uh, it becomes, uh, you know, one of the first cities that uh, Russia ultimately has been able to uh, take over uh, after battling for a month or more, trying to be able to uh, achieve some control of the cities and having retreated from the capital. Uh, so it becomes uh, at least a symbol that they haven't gone away. What more can the United States do short of actually intervening in the conflict that we haven't done already, or have we done pretty much what we can do? I think the most important thing for the United States right now is to remain united with our NATO allies. Uh, to continue to put pressure on, uh, uh, on the sanctions uh, and try to squeeze them and enforce them, uh, and to provide the weapons that are absolutely essential if the Ukrainians are going to continue their brave fight against the Russians. I think that's probably the most important thing that the United States and our allies can do, and obviously continue to reinforce our position in NATO. I, I think we're taking the right steps right now. Uh, the most important thing is to try to give the Ukrainians what they need in order to see if we can bring this war to an end. We've seen President Biden, of course, send a lot of armaments, most recently an $800 million installment of, of heavy weapons. Is it, can the president go as far as he needs to without congressional authorization? Because as I understand it, he's done a lot of this under his own discretion. Well, having uh, worked in the executive branch uh, you know, the power of a commander in chief to do what's necessary to uh, protect uh, security uh, is pretty broad. Uh, and besides that, I think uh, the president has been in touch with the leadership in the Congress uh, about the steps that are being taken. Uh, I think the leadership, the bipartisan leadership, is supportive of the steps that he's taking right now in unifying our allies. Uh, so I would assume that the president has some room here to continue to uh, provide what's necessary to the Ukrainians. 
Mr. Secretary, you were with us just about a month ago right now. We talked about the possibility of negotiations with the Russians. And in some and substance, you said, listen, what the Russians understand is when you inflict harm on them. This is part of what you had to say about how to get Vladimir Putin's attention. Make no mistake about it. Uh, diplomacy is going nowhere unless we have leverage, unless the Ukrainians have leverage. And the way you get leverage is by, frankly, uh, going in and killing Russians. This is a power game. Putin understands power. Uh, he really doesn't understand diplomacy very much. He understands power. There's been an awful lot of power, Mr. Secretary, that's been exerted in, in that month period by the Ukrainians. And as far as we can tell, quite a few Russians have been killed. How far further does it need to go before we can get Vladimir Putin's attention? Or is it possible at all? Well, David, I think we've uh, entered a very important phase of this war. Uh, it, there, I, I consider it to be three phases. The first phase was the failed effort by the Russians to invade and take over uh, Ukraine in rapid order. And they failed at doing that, and the Ukrainians put up a great fight uh, to protect their country. The second phase was just uh, siege warfare uh, and uh, destruction uh, and killing of innocent men, women, and children, uh, the way we saw in Bucha, which I think was just intended to try to break the will of the Ukrainian people, and that didn't happen. Uh, we're now in this third phase where they've retreated from the capital. They're trying to focus on the eastern part of Ukraine and the Donbass area. Uh, they're obviously sending out uh, as many missiles as they can. Uh, they're going to try to see if they can capture Mariupol. Uh, I, think, I think this is uh, a very decisive phase of this war. And the issue is going to be whether the Ukrainians can continue uh, to go after the Russians, interfere with their planning their efforts to try to gain a foothold in Donbash. And if they can hold on till May 9th, uh, I think there's a good chance they could ultimately force Putin uh, to some kind of negotiated settlement. But it has to be based on their use of force against Russians. Well, uh, maybe against Russia itself, I wonder, Mr. Secretary. There have been at least two instances reported of strikes inside Russia. And for that matter, the sinking of the Moskva, you could argue, was a, a shot inside Russia, their flagship of the Black Sea. How important is that? Do the, the Ukrainians need to ramp up their attacks against Russia? Well, you, Ukrainians are in war. Russia, this, this wasn't their idea. This is Russia's idea to uh, invade and try to take over Ukraine and kill uh, literally thousands of uh, innocent men, women, and children. So, you know, I have a lot of admiration for President Zelensky. Uh, he's at war, and he's doing what's necessary to defend his country. And frankly, when you're trying to defend your country, my view is any target uh, against the enemy becomes a credible target in terms of defending your country. Mr. Secretary, earlier in this interview, you said that alliance is critically important to the success of the United States and NATO. What vulnerabilities might it have? We've already seen Hungary, perhaps, get a little wobbly. Uh, and now we have an election coming up this coming weekend in France, where if Marine Le Pen were to win, what would that do to the alliance? Well, there's no question that, uh, that the alliance... Uh, the longer this war goes on, the more pressure there is to hold that alliance together because of various things going on in their individual countries, whether it's an election, whether it's politics, whether it's their concern about the economy. Uh, it's not easy to hold uh, that kind of tight unity of our allies, but it is very critical. I think uh, Joe Biden has his hands full, making very sure that the members of the NATO alliance stay united, stay committed. Uh, and focus on what's necessary in order to support Ukraine in this war against Russia. That has to happen. Is it going to be easy? No. Uh, there are going to be pressures that will arise, but it is now a matter of leadership to make damn sure that uh, that unity does not break apart. Mr. Secretary, when you talk about support for Ukraine, I'm mindful of those IMF World Bank meetings being held right now in Washington. And Ukraine has said they need a fair amount of money. I think I saw $5 billion a day or so. What can the United States and our allies do to make sure they get the funds they need to keep going? I think that's an area where uh, clearly the United States and our allies can continue to provide not only the arms and weapons that are necessary, but provide the funds that Ukraine needs in order to be able to continue to survive and defend their country. 
So I, I think from, in terms of the financial part of, of this equation, uh, I think that should be something that, uh, frankly, uh, should be a lot easier for both the United States and our allies to be able to provide that support uh, if they need it. And finally, Mr. Terry, we're mindful of the refugees. Obviously, the, the internally displaced people who've remained within Ukraine, but also so many refugees fleeing the country into places like Poland and other neighboring countries. How, how are we, and by that I mean the United States and our allies, doing in handling that refugee crisis? You know, my, my uh, son Jimmy, who's a member of Congress, uh, was there with a the delegation just these last few days. Uh, and... I asked him, I said, did you go to the refugee camps? He said, there, there aren't any refugee camps. The reality is that the Polish families have reached out and brought those refugees into their families. It's an incredible display of compassion uh, and support for the refugees. So right now, I think the most important thing we need to do is to continue to support Poland and those other countries that are providing refuge to these uh, desperate men and women who, are, who have to leave uh, the Ukraine in order to hopefully hold on to life. By the way, he said those refugees want to go back to the Ukraine. It's not that they want to come to the United States. They want to go back to the Ukraine and reestablish their lives. Yeah, we hope there's a Ukraine to go back to. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Always great to have you with us. That's Leon Panetta, former Secretary of Defense of the Panetta Institute for Public Policy. Coming up on Tax Day in the United States, we turn to Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors for an update on the economy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, it is tax day in the United States. It's not April 15, but because of a holiday on the 15th is now today the 18th. And that gives us an occasion to talk about taxes, but also the economy overall. And for that, we turn to Jared Bernstein, Dr. Jared Bernstein of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. So, Jared, thank you so much for being with us. Let's start with taxes. And, and I'll, if I can connect two things up, taxes and perhaps inflation. We just got a ruling from the Supreme Court today on the so-called SALT limitation on the deduction, uh, where basically it said you can charge more taxes. We're not going to give you a break from it. And what is the White House position on the SALT deduction? Well, first of all, let's start a little bit back from there, uh, because on tax day, I think it's really important uh, to look at the just such clear distinctions between where we're coming from and where congressional Republicans, particularly under Senator Rick Scott's plan, are coming from. This president has proposed significant tax relief for middle class families paid for by finally injecting some long-awaited fairness into the tax code, particularly as it affects millionaires and billionaires. The billionaires uh, uh, tax uh, is one of the features, of course, of, of our proposals, and uh, this uh, injects a level of fairness uh, that affects only the top 0.01%, the very richest people in our uh, society, and does uh, none of the president's taxes touch anybody below $400,000 per year, not a penny. On the other side, the Republicans have proposed a tax increase on middle-class families, doesn't touch the rich, on middle-class families up $1,500 a year on average, a $100 billion tax increase on middle and low-income families that, by the way, they threw in there this too, um, sunsets Social Security and Medicare uh, every five years. That is exactly the opposite direction this president this country needs to go. And the president has been clear, when he was a candidate, he was clear about really uh, reapportioning the taxes, quite apart from the amount of taxes charged. Correct. But going back to the SALT deduction for a moment, one mm -hmm. of the complaints against the SALT, the, uh, limiting the, the limitation on the SALT deduction was actually it does benefit the upper middle class, upper class people more than the lower class people. Does that mean the White House position is you're just fine with that limitation the way it is? The White House position on SALT has consistently been that we do not put uh, that in our budget. It's not there. You can't find it. And we are uh, have consistently worked 
uh, with congressional allies to try to find a measure there that works for both sides. But I think it's notable that that's not part of, our, of the president's tax policy. So, so let me turn also to the report we had of the World Bank today on global growth, which really took the global growth numbers down rather substantially. This is in the face of predictions from various people, including we did a survey of economists, as well as we had uh, uh, Bank of America come out and say there's really a concern about economists about a possible recession. Where do you put the probability of recession within the next, let me specify, 24 months? Well, I'm not going to give a probability. I don't think that would be appropriate. You can look at all the market shops with their different probabilities. I was just reading a Goldman Sachs report this morning. It looked like a very careful piece of work. They, not us, they uh, put the probability at 15 percent in the next 12 months, 35 percent, I believe, over the next 24. That's Goldman Sachs, and that's just one of many different market uh, predictions out there. Look, I think the thing that's getting missed in this recession probability discussion is the extent of tailwinds in the current economy. Now, obviously, the labor market is a big piece of that. Friday, a report came out that was kind of overlooked, and this was on state employment and unemployment rates. Uh, 17 states are posting their lowest unemployment rate on record. I think we all have to recognize the strength of the job market as a significant tailwind to this economy, providing income gains to working Americans. Household balance sheets are in very strong shape. That's also uh, something that, by the way, factored into those Goldman Sachs probabilities. You really have to look at the extent of savings and net worth uh, among households in the aggregate to understand the macroeconomic tailwinds that help push back on some of the very real headwinds that are also in play. And, Jared, don't get me wrong. I love those tailwinds. Those sound really good. <laughs> but what about some headwinds that may be outside your control? We had Secretary Yellen last last week, say, actually, the potentially enormous economic repercussions because of the war in Ukraine. And then we mm -hmm. have the problem with China, with their lockdown and what that might mean for the supply chain. How do you take those into account in making your projections? I think the important thing there is to, to really drill down into the diagnosis and understand that we have very strong demand, but we continue to have constraints in supply chains. Now, interestingly and importantly, in the labor market, we've actually seen some improvement in labor force participation. And if we can get that supply to come up to the strong levels of labor demand, that's going to continue to boost that tailwind. Now, on the energy side, which of course is key and very much related to uh, uh, Putin's unprovoked war, um, it is the case that since the president worked with allies to release 180 million barrels of oil from the strategic reserves over the next six months, that's our contribution, another 60 million, so we're up to 240 uh, from allies with whom he's organizing this, the price of gas at the pump has come down 20 cents. Now, there's a lot of dynamics that go into that global price. It's not just the strategic reserve release, but that is very much in the mix. And that's an example of the kind of effort that we can bring to the table to help ameliorate some of those supply constraints. Uh, Jared, I saw there was a report came out of your shop, the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, last week uh, that dealt with the economy very comprehensively. It was very long, 432 pages, I think, as I recall. <laughs> but one of the things it said specifically was the problems of the supply chain go beyond the pandemic. They go to things like climate and some of the disruptions of, of climate. How do you incorporate those because maybe some of these constraints which do drive inflation may go beyond actually the temporary effects yeah. of the pandemic. That's really important. I mean, we're, we're so ensconced in current events as we should be. But I think what we tried to get into in the economic report of the president, that's the piece you're describing, and particularly in the supply chain chapter, is some of the uh, more lasting uh, issues we have there with, with uh, uh, making our, our supply chains more resilient, more flexible. And in fact, that relates right back to um, the president's agenda. Okay, so onshoring things that we uh, need, and particularly in terms of security risks, of credit risks, the kinds of uh, uh, defense or health risks where uh, you saw that exposed during the pandemic, uh, but also ways in which we're not, that, that our, our, our chain has kind of a broader pipe, a broader portfolio. There were instances in the last uh, year or so where literally one or two microchip plants would come off production and you'd see plants around here in Canada and Mexico closed for, for six weeks. Uh, that, that kind of a thin, unresilient mm. supply chain, it did exist before the pandemic. And that chapter, which I commend to everyone, really gets into how we, we can fix that over the longer term.
Jared, it's always such a pl pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for your time today. That's My Jared pleasure. Bernstein of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Coming up, COVID lockdowns taking a toll on the Chinese economy as consumer spending slumps. More on that conversation still ahead. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West. And China has to be in the news pretty much every day, given the size of that economy. And today is certainly no exception. For a readout right now, what the markets are telling us about the Chinese economy, we turn to Kriti Gupta. So, Kriti, what are they telling us? Yeah, well, we got a ton of data, right? But I think one of the most uh, important things that caught my eye was what Chinese bonds are doing. And we don't tend to spend a ton of time, um, at least in the U.S. hours, looking at Chinese bonds, or the yield at least. But this is important because I think when a lot of people say, do you want to invest in China, you're expecting a little bit of risk, a little bit of regulatory risk. It's an emerging market, so it's going to be a little bit more volatile. But you're expecting to be rewarded for that. Well, it turns out, if you look at the Chinese bond market, they're now offering a yield less than that of the U.S. Treasury bond, which is interesting, right? It means that if you hop into the U.S. Treasury uh, market, not only are you getting a higher uh return, but you're getting essentially less risk as well, which is kind of counterintuitive to how it's supposed to work. And this is significant because this hasn't really happened for at least a decade where you have the Chinese yield premium over the Treasury market just disappearing completely. So that's going to be something you want to keep your eye on. Does it reverse and uh, or does it get worse? Well, so explain that to me for a minute. Normally, if you showed me a chart like that, I would say that indicates that they think U.S. Treasury bonds are riskier than Chinese bonds, which doesn't sound right to me. Right. And a lot of it it comes down to what the PBOC is doing, right? It always comes down to interest rates, especially in this environment where you have an extremely aggressive Federal Reserve. And the PBOC, by the way, is one of the very few banks uh, or central banks around the world, at least in major economies, I want to say the only one that was actually looking to be a little bit more stimulative. Remember, they're dealing with uh, a decline in consumer spending. They're dealing with uh, more COVID lockdowns, um, something that they're trying or really struggling with to ramp up again. So to be a little bit more stimulative meant uh, decreasing the the reserve requirement ratio meant cutting interest rates. And last week, they weren't actually able to do that. They only decreased the reserve requirement ratio by 25 basis points. And even then, they weren't rewarded by the market. So if I'm an investor, I know what the PBOC is doing. They announce it, right? Do I know what's going on with the Chinese economy? Uh, no. And that's really where it gets a, a little... Uh, tough to kind of to, to guess, right? Because you did see some not so great numbers come out on consumer spending, but that was to be expected as you see uh, Chinese consumers deal with the COVID lockdown. Um, but you also have to keep an eye on GDP growth. You saw, I believe, a 4.8% year over year acceleration. The estimate was 4.2%. And if you actually look at some of these numbers, a, a lot of analysts see a little bit more skepticism in terms of are these numbers real, just given the struggles in the broader global economy. Okay, thank you so much for the report on China from Kriti Gupta. Coming up, are we facing another wave of COVID? We're going to talk with Dr. Kathleen Newsel of the University of Maryland. That's coming up next, and we are on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. As the Fed continues to tackle inflation, Bill Dudley, Bloomberg Economics Senior Advisor and also former president of the New York Fed, was on Bloomberg earlier today, and he said that there may well be a hard landing, and frankly, it'd be better for the economy if it happens sooner rather than later. This is part of what he had to say. The labor market is extraordinarily tight. You know, everyone's focused on what's having to headline inflation and has it peaked. And I think they're missing the forest from the trees here because what's really going on is the labor market has not been this tight in many, yeah. many, many decades. And that's the problem because if the labor market's too tight, wages are going to continue to strengthen. And if wages continue to strengthen, we're not going to go back to 2% inflation. Bill Dudley, that intern at Goldman Sachs, Jan Hatzi, has, has said that on the show here a couple days ago, that the labor market is shockingly tight. Does that lead to the wage spiral? Michelle Meyer just spoke about it. And frankly, that is the collective memory of the 60s, isn't it? Well, I'm not sure how fast what inflation will go up because we have a lot of other factors pushing inflation down. But I think the key thing to focus on is if the labor market's this tight, what's going to happen to wage inflation? 
Wage inflation currently is running around five and a half percent, depending on which measure you, you, you use. Five and a half percent wage inflation is not consistent with the Fed's two percent inflation objective. So how do you get inflation down? You need to push the unemployment rate up. And that's the problem. Every time the Federal Reserve had to tighten monetary policy enough to push the unemployment rate up, they've ended up in a full scale recession. The key question is just when is this going to occur? And it's not going to occur in the near term because the Fed hasn't yet made monetary policy tight. Uh, it might not even happen in 2023 uh, because we don't really know how aggressive the Federal Reserve is going to be in terms of tightening monetary policy. But if the Fed uh, delays, all that means is inflation will get more entrenched and they'll have to do more later. So a hard landing is inevitable, whether it happens in 23 or 24, that depends on the Fed. Do you anticipate they will delay? Based on what you've heard, Bill, how do you think they will respond to a mechanical peak in inflation this year? Well, I think they're going to take some signal from the fact that inflation is coming down because it's going to support their story about the transitory factors being a primary driver of why inflation moved up. But, you know, if inflation is 8 percent for a year and then 2 percent for a year because all the transitory factors are washing out, the average is still five. And, you know, if the labor market continues to tighten, which I think is likely, you know, the unemployment rate is already at 3.6 percent. It could fall even further. Uh, it doesn't really matter what happens to transitory inflation. Uh, what, it doesn't really matter what happens to the headline inflation. You have to look beneath the surface what's like actually going on in terms of the tightness of the labor market and its consequences for wage inflation. Bill, what you're saying is pretty radical. Uh, you're suggesting that perhaps the Fed should cause the hard landing sooner and closer to now than wait because the consequences will be that much worse. Is that accurate? Well, I don't know that they should cause, try to cause the recession. I mean, I think they should always, always go for the soft landing. But what they need to do is they need to make monetary policy tighter sooner. Uh, I think the big uh, discussion here about what, what, whether the Fed's done a good job or a bad job is the timing. Uh, we're still at a quarter to a half percent federal funds rate at a time that the unemployment rate is 3.6 percent and year over year CPI inflation is eight and a half percent. It's remarkable. The Fed's late. Uh, they know they're late. That's why we're talking about 50 basis point rate hike at each of the next couple meetings. The Fed wants to get to neutral very quickly, but they haven't really signaled much appetite for going very far beyond that. If you look at the last summary of economic projections, the, the monetary policy setting anticipated in, at the end of 2023 was just a very tight very, a very, a very modestly tight monetary policy setting. That was Bill Dudley. He's Bloomberg Economics senior advisor. As we keep focused on the economy, we also have to keep at least one eye on COVID because cases are starting to tick back up in the United States. To give us her read on where we are right now, we turn now to Dr. Kathleen Newsel. She's director of the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. So, doctor, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Are we facing another wave? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's the question. There are a number of issues that are making it a little bit harder to read than it was before. One is we have a lot of people using at-home COVID tests, and, and then we don't feed those into our national metrics where we follow this. And, um, and, and so that's, that's clearly a, a component of all of this. You know, we have children, many children who were just off for, for spring break and, and just off for um, Easter and, and Passover holidays. So I think we'll have to watch this very closely. So what could we do, if anything, doctor, to get better intelligence, as it were, on where we stand with children, with adults? Are there other ways to test? I've, I've, I've read accounts, for example, some places testing wastewater. Yeah, the wastewater, I think we do this for many other diseases around the world. And while you can't get precision on number of cases, you can see trends with wastewater. You know, is it starting to go up? Is it starting to go down? And those sort of trends can help us because many states recently lessened many of their restrictions. So, you know, we would expect to see some increase. But this environmental surveillance can help us with the trends. When it comes to individual testing, you mentioned a lot of home testing, which we do, and that doesn't necessarily get reported. Is that the problem, or is there also a shortage of funds? Because, as you know, Congress has been talking about appropriating more funds, as I understand, some of which would go for testing. Are we running short on federal funds? So I don't think it's a problem that people are home testing. I think that's exactly what we want them to be doing is, is home testing and taking action. However, it can add to the difficulty of, of monitoring and, and surveillance and how accurate and complete that reporting is. 
In terms of funding, however, I will advocate for more funding. This pandemic is not over. You know, we still have many unvaccinated people, many immunocompromised people who are, are still at risk for severe disease. And we absolutely need to have the funding for the countermeasures, for the surveillance, for the testing. Doctor, where are we on the vaccinations for small children? So the, the group with the lowest vaccination rates, and you know, we're still under a third are that five to 11 year old group. Now there was some good news reported by the company, by Pfizer last week, you know, with a, a third booster dose will help, but, but first we need to get those kids with their initial two doses of vaccine. So we have some work to do there in that age group. Uh, finally, talk to us, doctor, if you would, about long COVID. Uh, and I must say, some of this is anecdotal. Most of us now know someone, even someone who's had all the vaccinations and the boosters, who gets COVID and it turns into long COVID, really, really has potentially devastating effect. What do we know about it? What research have we done? What haven't we done yet? Yeah, well, we are learning a lot about long COVID. You know, just by the definition of it, this is still a relatively new disease, right? We're just beginning our, our third year with this disease. And so as we go along, we are learning some of the medium and longer term effects. You may have seen some of the new reports on the effects in, in the brain where, you know, normal aging of the brain is accelerated with COVID. From what we've seen so far, the vaccine can lessen those medium and long-term effects, but that's what we truly need to understand. Would early treatment with antivirals, would early treatment with antibody, and can, can vaccine mitigate some of these medium or long-term effects? Doctor, really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for your time. It's Dr. Kathleen Nuzzo of the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Coming up, our Monday midterms 2022 check-in with contributors Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano of Iona College. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world, we turn to Riddick Gupta with First Word. Thanks, David. Russian President Vladimir Putin gave a special elite designation to an army unit that Ukraine has accused of committing war crimes in the town of Bucha. Today, Putin awarded the 64th Motorized Infantry Brigade the honorary title of guard, citing mass heroism and uh, valor. Ukraine's defense ministry identified the unit as one involved in war crimes during the occupation of Bucha. Police say more than 350 bodies have been collected in the Kyiv suburb. Almost all of them were shot. Putin says Western sanctions against Russia aren't working, citing the recovery in the ruble to pre-war levels. We can now confidently say that such policy of sanctions towards Russia has failed. The economic blitzkrieg strategy didn't work. Moreover, the initiators themselves couldn't get away with the sanctions. I'm talking about inflation and unemployment growth and economic dynamics worsening in the U.S. and the European countries. Meanwhile, Russia's central bank says it's found no clear alternatives to the world's major reserve currencies. Sanctions have left the Bank of Russia holding only gold and yuan. Before the invasion, a third of its total was in euros, in addition to investments in pounds and the yen. That made it possible for international governments to seize about half of the bank's stock Pile. According to Bloomberg Economics, capital controls have steadied Russia's financial sector and propped up the ruble, but a recession triggered by the sanctions is likely to be deep and prolonged. The Supreme Court turned away four public school teachers who claim New York City violated their constitutional rights by firing them or putting them on unpaid leave for refusing to get COVID-19 vaccinations. The justices made no comment in rejecting the teacher's appeal, which challenged the city's vaccine mandate for its 148,000 employees. The same group of teachers failed last year to block the policy before it took effect. Global News 24 hours a day 
on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Ritika. It is Monday, and that means it's the Balance of Power Midterms 2022 update with our political contributors, Jeannie Shanzano of Iona College and Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital. So, Rick, I want to start with Ohio today. I mean, we have so many fascinating primaries, actually. But let's let's take a look at Ohio today with this, if I can call it, melodrama playing out with J.D. Vance and two other Republicans all seeking President Trump's, former President Trump's uh, endorsement. Yeah, this is a pretty equally divided campaign with uh, Josh Mandel sort of pulling ahead of everybody else, including J.D. Vance. But Trump weighs in with the underdog and decided that celebrity goes beyond uh, political experience and, uh, and, and announced his support for J.D. Vance. Now the question is, will that pay off? And, of course, the primary is only a couple of weeks away on May 3rd. So we're going to learn about this one sooner than probably any of the other gambles that Donald Trump has made. Yeah, and what we've been hearing is, of course, that candidates are having to go down to Mar-a-Lago and sort of audition for his support, if you will. And what's fascinating about J.D. Vance is he was very critical of Donald Trump, which was acknowledged when Donald Trump <laughs> endorsed him, and yet he endorsed him anyways. And just historically, for a former president to be engaged in selecting amongst, as Rick mentioned, you know, very close, you know, in races that are close, these primaries, a favored candidate who, by the way, isn't even winning in the polls is something to be noted. So Donald Trump putting himself out there again because, of course, he's going to have a score at the end of this primary season in terms of how many winners he picked. Yeah, at the same time, there is a Democratic side to this race, right, Rick? And we have uh, the Congressman Ryan actually running for the Democratic nomination. And he's really come out with some pretty tough ads, particularly on China. Yeah, look, I think that uh, China is one of those things that appeals to all voters. Any China time you can do some China bashing, uh, I think in this political cycle, you're going to see a lot of people participate in that. But he's one of the first Democrats to really use a foreign policy issue to try and get votes early in the cycle. And that is going to be a close race. I mean, Ohio is going to be a very tricky uh, race, uh, even though uh, Trump won it handily and uh, Rob Portman was, you know, a superstar. Uh, uh, Democrats get elected statewide there all the time. Sherrod Brown's a great example, and Ryan's trying to fall into that tradition. You know, and you listen to Tim Ryan's defense of this is fascinating because what he's saying is, before Trump, I have been saying these things as have everybody who's won in Ohio for many years. You go right back six years ago, you look at Strickland versus Portman. They were talking about the same thing, China taking the jobs of people who live in Ohio. So Tim Ryan is making the case. This has nothing to do with Asian hate or bashing, obviously. This has to do with jobs, and I'm going to talk about it because because people in Ohio, he has said, as he goes around the state, it's the number one issue on their minds. They feel like their jobs are going overseas and they want somebody in this race who's going to protect them. I think it's going to be interesting to see how many Democrats in these close races end up following suit. Yeah, and Jeannie, one of the things that I'm uh, befuddled by is the redistricting. They're drawing lines pretty late here. I mean, we've heard a lot about New York, where there's been a lot of litigation, but now Florida as well, they're redrawing lines. I think some of the people running don't even know which district they're running for. That's right. <laughs> it's, you know, we have Florida, I mean, New York's still in court, and then you have Florida, where the state legislature, after the governor vetoed the redistricting, they threw their hands up and left it in his hands. Now there's going to be a special session where we understand Democrats may boycott, <laughs> and if they go with DeSantis' map, it's going to really favor Republicans. So, Rick, you're a campaign yeah, manager. What do you do as a campaign manager when you don't know where your lines are? Well, first of all, your lines are, are pretty well drawn in uh, 46 of the states. So it's a small problem, uh, uh, but limited, but not unlimited to big states. And so Florida is a great example. Those lines could dramatically change. Of course, they're fitting in a brand new congressional district. So things were going to change anyway. But this DeSantis plan could really <laughs> modify the state, much like Democrats did in New York. But the bottom line is these guys run in, in sort of poorest areas, uh, poorest areas. Uh, voters are going to get their campaign slogans on TV and radio. They're going to get the mail anyway. Uh, and, and, and the lines will catch up to the election. Let's just spend a minute here on issues, if we could. What about uh, crime, violence, guns, given particularly what's happened? Just listen, in the last few days, I mean, certainly we had the shooting in Brooklyn and New York, but even since then, we had the one in Pittsburgh. We've got, we've got it all over the country. Is that going to be a big issue, Rick? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, uh, the president put it on the table at his State of the Union where he said, fund the police. And, and since then, has sort of taken time out of his schedule to try and hit the crime issue. And as you say, this weekend, we're just reminded by four different mass shootings uh, of the problems that especially cities are having controlling crime. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised that this is something that the president has to focus time on. It is one of the sort of social issues that he can be tough on without losing base support. Uh, and so I think this is something we're going to hear a lot of from him between now and Election Day. Well, Jeannie, I thought it was interesting. Over the weekend, we heard from Eric Adams, the mayor here in New York City, and he made the point, don't blame it on the blue states. Actually, if you look at the murder rate, it's higher in a lot of red states than it is in blue states. This is not a Democratic problem alone. And that's an argument Eric Adams has been making since he ran. He also made the case... The Build Back Better bill that so many Republicans voted against contained funding for police. And so Eric Adams is saying this is not a red or a blue issue. You look at the, you know, some of these, like Tulsa, for instance, the murder rate is higher. And so it's something that the president has tried to wrap his hands around. He's going to have to own this issue. It's a tough issue for Democrats, of course. But one of the big things that the president is trying to do is talk about guns. That's what he was doing before the shooting in New York the other day. So, Rick, last question. Uh, Jeannie says it's not a red or blue issue. At least that's what a lot of Democrats are saying. Do the voters perceive it as a red or blue issue? You know, I think that uh, when you look at rhetoric, uh, certainly Democrats, especially led by the uh, progressive liberals like AOC, have made it a cause celeb to sort of hug a thug, right? That's a theme that has permeated within the sort of far left side of the Democratic Party. The Republicans do not have that kind of dissonance within their messaging. So Democrats are actually fighting with themselves before they can actually go out and make a, a cogent pitch to voters. Now, I'm not sure if I've heard that before, but I expect to see it on some bumper stickers, some Republican bumper stickers. To hug a thug. That's, pre that's pretty good, Rick. Thank you so much. Coming up, we're going to talk with Rick and Jeannie about the always fascinating Sarah Palin, and this time, how her race for the House seat up in Alaska is working out for her. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Up in Alaska, it's not just the midterms. It's also a special election for the seat left open when Republican Congressman Don Young passed away. And the best known of the 48, count them, 48 candidates is former governor and vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. Contributors Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis are still with us. So, Rick, uh, you're the expert in Sarah Palin last time I checked. Uh, the thing that I'm finding interesting is she's best known, but I'm hearing a lot from Trump supporters. There's at least man on the street, person on the street, who are saying, yeah, okay, fine, we know her, but we're not sure she's really Alaskan anymore. Yeah, you know, she's got a love-hate relationship with Alaska, and since she walked out of the governor's mansion before the end of her term and quit, uh, it's been a really rocky road. I would say, though, in a recent poll, uh, her fave-unfave is 37 to, like, 51, and she's getting 90% in that same poll of her favorables voting for her. So you got a problem where that's really extraordinary to have that many people uh, voting for you out of your faves, but it means also that there may not be anybody else left there to vote for you. Yeah, you know, we do have Rick Davis to thank for Sarah Palin. So thank you, Rick Davis. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeannie. You're welcome. And, uh, you know, it is interesting. Of course, this is a crowded field. So, she, and they have a new voting system in Alaska. So she is absolutely, I believe, going to get into the top four on name recognition alone. I think the real challenge for Sarah Palin is can she get through that second round? And that is going to be tough, as Rick mentioned, because when you have that much support with your favorables, she She's going to have to really spend time appealing. And the word that's coming out of the focus groups and the polling is quitter. Alaskans are not forgiving her for quitting the governorship. And they're also frustrated that she moved out of state. And, you know, even people who support Donald Trump and are very conservative and like her politics are having a bit of trouble with the fact that she doesn't seem as committed to Alaska as she did to herself when she quit. So I think it's it, but it's not something she can't get over. I think she can still do it. But it's going to be a bit of work on her. So, so, Rick, that takes us back to J.D. Vance a little bit and the significance of the Trump endorsement, because former President Trump has, of course, endorsed Sarah Palin. Is that going to make a difference up in Alaska? Sure, it will. I mean, probably one of the few states that he can have a lot of impact is, is a state like Alaska that went so far overwhelmingly for him. Look, it's a GOP state. It's a Republican state. 
And, and one of the other contestants in this race, who was only about 10 points behind Sarah Palin, is a Republican running. And then the, the one person between them, about five points back, is an independent. And the independents are very strong in Alaska. Also, Lisa Murkowski basically has become an independent in the state who's uh, one of their senators. So uh, I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see how much time Trump has to actually help her. Because as we know, the, the 11th of June is the, is the primary runoff cutoff where 48 people will be on the ballot. But then it's only 60 days later that they have what's you know basically the equivalent of the general election right. on August 16th. And so it does put a little more pressure on time yeah. to, for Trump to have this impact. But it'll give us a lot to talk about. Thank you so much to Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, our expert political contributors. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. And this, this is Bloomberg.